right, Jim Lee, welcome to uh, Tales from the Rabbit Hole. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it, Mick. It's been a long time. We've talked a couple times on the phone. I've heckled you quite a bit on your uh, <laughs> forum, and um, it's, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, well, I've actually known you well online for quite a long time because you've been uh, kind of active in the, I guess, the chemtrails sphere online. Uh, is that kind of an accurate description of how you kind of, uh, yeah, how we how you got started in this type of thing? I would agree with that. Um, so yeah, I would say probably back in two thousand eight was about right. the time that I you know became interested in geoengineering and the topic. And around two thousand ten through two thousand fourteen. I became a member of Ken Caldera's geoengineering group mm -hmm. and did a little bit of debating in there with Ken Caldera and Steven Salter and John Latham, the guys from the Silver Lining Project, Marine Cloud Brightening Project. And it's kind of funny how it evolved from you know, me having a serious discussion about the difference between weather modification and geoengineering to more of a focus on... Uh, you know, the the entire chemtrail debate, because I see this major overlap where there's mo more of a focus on chemtrails and less of a focus on actual weather modification and geoengineering. So that's how I initially got into the debate about, you know, chemtrails. And, you know, the, the at, at first, you know, I was inclined to believe everything. Um, you know, I had a blog resonated.com. I was anonymous and, you know, you rightly so pointed out a lot of the holes in my theories and, um, you know, basically my, my opinion on the entire chemtrail debate has evolved quite a bit over time. And what I really see now as the problem is that yeah, it comes down to a lot of semantics um, that, mm -hmm. you know, chemtrails being a high level descriptor, you know, to, to a lot of people, contrails are a high level descriptor, you know, meaning that they have different meanings for different people. Um, you know, you, you can't, you know, it's not an apple or an orange, you know what I mean? If you say chemtrail, right. it could mean many different things to many different people. Um, well, let's so, just back up real quick, just to uh, make sure everyone understands what you're talking about there, because uh, not, not everybody is going to be entirely familiar with uh, even the terms chemtrails and contrails. Okay. So uh, chemtrails are basically just the theory that the, the clouds that are left behind plane, the, the white trails left behind planes, are sometimes kind of deliberate spraying. And there's this whole conspiracy theory built up around this that suggests all kinds of different reasons why uh, people, you know, the government might be spraying. And one of those theories is what you mentioned, which is geoengineering, which is the idea that we can actually do things like spraying things into the atmosphere to modify the climate. And so there's become this, uh, this major variant of the chemtrail theory is that there's a secret project going on to modify the climate via this uh, covert geoengineering, which they're performing secretly. Uh, and that's you know something that you've obviously talked about in the past. So I just want to make sure, like, uh, when we discuss yeah. things, we 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 uh, explain what we're talking about because you know you and I know all these things, but uh, not everybody is familiar with you know every little nuance. Anyway, so you were saying. So yeah, like I said, my 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 views on the topic have evolved obviously over time, um, but what I see is the biggest problem is that. You know, while a lot of people attribute, you know, I don't follow the whole it's depopulation. I don't mm -hmm. follow the whole, you know, um, I do believe that it is geoengineering. And I believe that because scientists have said so. Um, the difference being that, you know, Chuck Long from NOAA's CRES Earth System Research Lab, when he called um, aircraft contrails accidental geoengineering, um, you know, he was referring to planes whitening the sky. And what he was actually referring to wasn't even the clouds, you know, which is kind of ironic. Um, you know, most of the prominent chemtrail websites specifically called the clouds that are coming out of planes geoengineering. Whereas Chuck Long said, 
you know, ice haze is brightening the sky. So he referred to this as accidental geoengineering. And I seem to recall in the same uh, aforementioned geoengineering group uh, with Ken Caldera, you and Ken Caldera debating what geoengineering would look like to average people. Do you remember that conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do remember. Yeah, because you know, what, what we're talking about here is with the, the whitening is that yeah. if you have more, more particulates in the air, you get more, more of the haze. And this is, this is the haze you can see very easily. If you look straight up, the sky looks uh, a deep blue. And if you look towards the horizon, it looks white because you're looking through more particulates. And the idea is that if there was some kind of geoengineering that was spraying stuff, then it would look more whiter. You would look, when you look straight up, it would look more like what you'd look like the horizon. And yeah, they did, um, they done various studies, I think, like computer models mm -hmm. on you know, what it would look like. And uh, there would be a detectable difference, I think, but not one that's particularly noticeable given all the variations that we see in the sky uh, from day to day. A lot of people now, they point at the actual sky now and they say that it looks whiter than it did before, which you know may, may well be possible because there's a lot more aviation and pollution than there was before. That, and, and that's exactly what I say, you know, and, and it's no secret that what I try to do is take people who believe in the conspiracy theory like I did, that it was every single plane in the sky is part of some nefarious geoengineering program. And I don't believe that's possible. You know, I've I've focused on jet fuel, uh, what's in the jet fuel the you know soot and metals that are coming out how they form clouds what those clouds how they affect climate how they affect you know health um yeah i've really f shifted my focus to that but i still hold out the contention that you know there is a possibility that secret geoengineering could occur um and i base this on two two main premises mm -hmm. um one that there have been two prominent geoengineering studies about, you know, that d direct application via airlines. Um, one by David Keith, you know, with the Aurora um, um, Aerospace uh, Sciences, and then one more recently. Um, and in both of those papers, they said they only needed anywhere from four to at max 100 planes to geoengineer the planet. So, if that's true, then when we have 150,000 flights per day, when we have at any given time over America 5,000 flights, um, it doesn't mean that every single flight would have to be part of some nefarious scheme to geoengineer the planet. Um, and then the second point I would make is that history tends to repeat itself. And what, we, what we've seen in the past is that the CIA, Henry Kissinger, the Air Force at Wright-Patterson and the, um, the U.S. Navy at China Lake were involved in Operation Popeye, Operation Motor Pool, where they did weather warfare over Vietnam. Simultaneously, the CIA was involved in Project Nile Blue, where they were doing cloud seeding over the Gulf of Mexico to deny rainfall to Cuba to kill um, Castro's sugar crops. So then, of course, following that, there was a weather warfare ban of 1978 um, in MOD. And, you know, since then, there really hasn't been a lot of discussion in the public sphere at all about weather modification, let alone the fact that weather warfare is possible. Um, there mm -hmm. is no way to verify. Um, this was just as recent as the last weather modification conference. I went to the one in 2018 and interviewed Raytheon, U.S. Naval Research Lab, Dr. Daniel Rosenfeld, Dr. William Cotton, who was part of Project Storm Fury. I interviewed a lot of these climate scientists, James Roger Fleming, my hero. Um, and what, you know, basically what I got from that is that while all these technologies are, you know, in use, while the CIA has a history of weather warfare, the CIA also funded the National Academy of Sciences reports on climate intervention, um, the one on CDR, um, carbon um, capture and um, stratospheric aerosol injection. That was funded by the CIA. Dr. Alan Robach, a geoengineer, said, I got a call from the CIA asking if another country was controlling the weather over our country, would we know it? 
And he also stated at the same time, I was wondering, were they asking me if we were controlling the weather over another country, would they know it? Well, Diane Seidel at the weather modification conference said very clearly, we cannot detect rogue geoengineering. And for me, that's a problem. So on the one hand, well, I, this, I, let me just go, go into, go, let me just stop you real there. Cause I think, you know, you, this is an issue that's come up before is that you're very fluidly shifted between two concepts there. The idea of geoengineering, which is climate modification and the idea of weather modification. And I think a lot of people are familiar with weather modification in terms of cloud seeding. A lot of things you mentioned there were just cloud seeding where uh, things are sprayed into clouds to increase pre precipitation, which is a very different thing from the, the stratospheric climate engineering that we're talking about, which is about spraying things from planes at very high altitudes. So I see you kind of jumping back and forth there a lot between mentioning geoengineering and being weather modification. Now, I know some people would consider weather modification to be geoengineering, but really it's a very, very localized thing that's done on clouds like they do it here where we are in the mountains in the Sierras to increase the, uh, the snowpack. But it's not climate engine. It's not. It's not geoengineering. I, I agree with you. But here's 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 the rub. And this is this is one of the. If you go to Ken Caldera's forum, to this day, the second most viewed post on his entire forum is where I laid out the argument that we're talking about right now. Whereas weather modification is not geoengineering, geoengineering is weather modification. And this is confirmed by Dr. Ben Kravitz, by the um, several different geoengineering, geomip, um, many of the different, uh, the international geoengineering, um, what's it called, IGEA. Basically, what they say is that if we were to do geoengineering, that mimicking volcanoes will have the same effect that natural volcanoes have. It will modify weather on a global scale that it will oh. change rainfall patterns worldwide. So that's- But no that's, one's ever denied that. I mean, that's an obvious thing. If you change the climate, it changes the weather because the weather is localized expressions of the climate. Exactly. But if you change so, the weather, it doesn't change the climate. So just you know, saying that climate engineering is weather modification is kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of a pointless statement, I would argue, in that it's, it's you're making a connection between these things where there really isn't a connection. You're not doing weather modification when you're doing climate engineering. You're doing climate engineering, which, yes, it will have effects because it's raising or lowering the temperature of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the earth. But it's not the same as weather modification. And you're, I really would say you shouldn't be uh, confusing people by equating the two things. I don't I don't believe that I'm confusing people at all. In fact, um, Dr. Alan Robach said exactly the same thing. So this isn't just coming from me. Um, Dr. Alan Robach, geoengineer, in his 27 reasons not to geoengineer, said very clearly it will affect, will affect global weather. global rainfall patterns. So um yeah, but not in a way that they will actually understand. I mean, that's part of the problem. That's that's uh, the, that's even worse. And it, it, well, they, it's yeah. actually so, it's, ident it's identical to cloud seeding because, um, according to the National Academy of Sciences report in two thousand four, I believe it was or two thousand three, they said our view is the same as it was sixty years ago. That with cloud seeding, we don't know what the results are. They are completely unprovable. There's no efficacy to the science of cloud seeding. So the mm -hmm. same is true of geoengineering and climate engineering. Well, except uh, the cloud seeding either makes it rain a bit more or it doesn't make it rain a bit more. It doesn't have lots of side effects. The problem with climate engineering is that you're modifying the temperature of the entire planet, which has massive effects over the entire planet. Weather modification, they just don't know if it works. Climate engineering, we don't know if we're destroying the planet. So I think it's quite a big difference though. Yeah, but and, and, and I agree with that. And But at the same time, um, you know, like I said to Ken Caldera, the difference between global warming or climate change and geoengineering is God killed people or you killed people. And, you know, there's another argument on uh, Ken's forum, uh, SRM, how to deal with the losers. And they just clearly lay it out that, you know, as a result of geoengineering, people will die. 
Um, how are we going to pay for the losers? And the, the reason they're going to die is because the southern hemisphere will likely get drier and the northern hemisphere will get wetter. So, you know, and they said whether, you know, people are going to attribute these massive weather changes to climate engineering, whether real or not. And how are we going to deal with that? You know, obviously the public relations side of that. And, you know, how are we going to pay for the dead people? So that's what geoengineering governance is all about. And that's why I've been, you know, very fervent about being in this debate about geoengineering and weather modification, because the two, I believe, co you know, go co they coincide, they go hand in hand. Um, and I'll throw this other one at you. You know, the, the Indian Space Organization just recently said they found black carbon from aircraft emissions. It's the only possible source of it um, at 18 kilometers in the sky, which is in the stratosphere. So mm -hmm. what they're basically saying is the Indian Space Organization said that airline traffic, the exhaust coming out of airlines, are affecting their monsoons, destroying the ozone layer, and, you know, causing other problems. And this is directly attributable to the black carbon. So part of it is, you know, because of the Himalayas, you know, the mountains and the updraft, um, that basically updraft is carrying uh, this material into the stratosphere. So pollution. Aircraft, yeah, aircraft pollution is being raised into the stratosphere well what's in that mm -hmm. aircraft pollution it is carbon black dust it's soot the soot is filled with metals um and wrapped in sulfur so is that stratospheric sulfur injection intentional or unintentional it is it's it's sulfur being injected into the stratosphere chuck long says the sky is getting whiter we're doing accidental geoengineering um, MIT just recently had an article, we're about to stop in a massive accidental experiment in cooling the planet, and they were referring to ship tracks. Same idea. Um, it's chemtrails, but, you know, 50 miles wide and thousands of miles long, a marine yeah. stratocumulus. So the idea that, you know, this isn't geoengineering is no longer an is issue. They, they call it accidental geoengineering. Um, well, they so, call uh, carbon dioxide emissions accidental geoengineering as well. Anything that humans do that affects the planet can be called accidental geoengineering. You could say the heat island effect of cities because you've got all this black asphalt uh, absorbing the sun is essentially a form of geoengineering. But I just want to go back to one thing you mentioned earlier about saying that geoengineering will kill people. And you know, this is something you know, that people have, have talked about. If we do geoengineering, there will be winners and losers. But the idea of geoengineering is that there would be uh, less net, losers net than if we didn't do it. I and mean, that we're trying to, uh, the idea is to avert some kind of catastrophic change in uh, the environment that would require a massive readjustment of society, which would require, not require, but it would uh, result in more deaths. You know, if suddenly all the crops failed yeah. by a natural means, then yeah. So it's not like we're trying to decide whether or not to kill all these people. It's kind of like, um, you're probably familiar with the trolley problem, which is a philosophy problem. Yeah. Which is, you know, there's a runaway trolley and yeah. there's, there's, there's five people on the line ahead of you, but you could go it off to another branch of the line. You could redirect it where there's only like two people. Like, do you but pull those are, the lever? That's your mom, but that's your mom and dad, so make a choice. <laughs> yeah. Or even if it's not, though. If, it, if, yeah. if it's strangers, people uh, have a lot of difficulty with making a decision to kill people though the people would rather let you know nature think in this case a runaway trolley take its course and there's you know people done experiments with this it's kind of a fun not fun but it's a very interesting thing to study what people's reactions are to this so i can see you know with the geo geoengineering thing you know, david keith says yes ten thousand tens of thousands of people will die because of this but you know he also doesn't really mention that the idea is that hundreds of thousands or even millions of people will not die because of it, but you have to pull the trigger and you're, you're, choo you're choosing some people rather than other. So I just want to clear up that it's not that we're, we're, we're going to kill lots of people just for some uh, technological reason. It's to stop other people. Well, let, let's define what you're talking about. So th this is what's called the clathrate gun hypothesis. You're, you're familiar with that, correct? Uh, well, remind me. 
because I mean, okay, I'm so, so so basically <laughs> they they, 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 they they dug into the ice cores at the, uh-huh. at the at the poles, and they basically dug down to where they say the dinosaurs are, and they look at it and they say right here we have dinosaur farts, and that's a lot of CO two, followed by a massive increase in methane. So the theory behind the clathrate gun hypothesis or runaway global warming is that dinosaur farts melted methane clathrates or frozen methane, which then vented into the atmosphere and caused runaway global warming, which killed the dinosaurs. This is what the modern you know, science behind the runaway global warming effect is based on is that Right now, they say we have methane clathrates that are venting that um, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group says that because of CO2, you know, that it's you know melting these methane deposits and that any moment we could have runaway global warming. Therefore, we should geoengineer. Um, yeah. Therefore, it, you know, the AOCs of the world and, you know, individuals like that. That are saying we only have twelve years to live. I mean, the, the, it's it's so outrageous. Guess, the claim. That's not really a mainstream, not really a mainstream view, though. The the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, you know, I'm sure you see it whenever it comes up on the uh, the geoengineering group on on Google Groups. People don't really take them that seriously. Oh, you know, people well, look at yeah, things like yeah. uh, the 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 methane melting, and yeah, but they they, they usually talk about it in terms of for like a hundred years. But some people are saying like it's going to happen in the next decade and that we're all going to die. Uh, and you know, I don't really think it's the mainstream view amongst the, the climate scientists that we're all yeah. going to die in 10 years. So, um, it, well, I mean, it, I, I, I agree with you on that. Um, in fact, when I brought up the, the clathrate gun hypothesis in the a- Arctic Methane Emergency Group, um, I, I brought up the fact that they were talking about Ken Caldera um, on their website and Ken immediately ran to the forum and said, I disavow John Neeson and I have nothing to do with the Arctic methane emergency yeah. group. And yeah. I want to be, they should remove me immediately from it. So I understand there's infighting there. I understand that there's not full agreement on that topic. And I understand that this originally, you know, the whole CO2 idea came from what was called the calendar effect. Um, you know, back in the early 1930s, um, and yeah, that, but, but, but I maintain that, you know, even though, um, Guy Stewart calendar, you know, basically formed this idea behind CO2 and global warming, anthropogenic global warming, um, that the climate models that they're using, they they don't have enough information to make the kind of determinations they're making. That even the geoengineering uh, model in compa- intercomparison um, program GeoMIP um, that they don't have enough information to make the kind of predictions that they're making. That you know that basically they're playing with fire. They're using insufficient statistics to base all this on, and they're not taking into account you know so many factors like solar cycles galactic cosmic rays, aerosols, aerosol cloud interactions, the greatest unknown in climate science. So why quote. would why would they do it then? Why would they be having a secret geoengineering program if they don't know if it works or not? Well, because the CIA has stated and the, and the, the Defense Department has stated in at least 20 documents that I've been able to accrue that climate change is a national, you know, strategic defense problem so yeah but why then would they take the risk of making it worse well it, 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 look at the history of the military i mean we got the westford needles do i really need to say more um well yeah. you probably did because no one's ever heard of the west okay needles. this so was the, an experiment uh spray needles into space to change the ionosphere yeah, they, they basically wanted to create a artificial ionosphere. Um, and, and the interesting point about this is just before that, in 1958, M. Garodsky and uh, another um, Russian individual said, we could put metallic particles into space and melt the poles. Um, Carol, uh, 
Livingston Riker in 1921 said we could reroute the Gulf Stream to you know make it flow into the Arctic and melt the poles. Right. Jules Verne. No one actually yeah, tried for, that though. Yeah, I know, but, but for a hundred years, go ahead. for uh, radio uh, radio communications, basically, they were trying to you know, make a reflective thing. Was yes, that, that was the idea were? behind the Westford needles. But we weren't trying to it, affect the weather. It's coincidental that for at least 50 years up to that point. In major publications, atomize the Arctic. There are many, many different um, people. You know, UNESCO. That was what uh, Huxley said. That um, let's atomize the Arctic. Yeah, you know, for fifty years, there the entire rave was the discussion of melting the poles. And I then I don't along- think anybody thinks that's a good idea now, though. I mean, can uh, you, you you've talked to all these scientists. I well, do some actually, of them, and I can and I, and I can melting back that the Arctic. Up. Yes. yes. It's it's still a very real thing. Um, if you look at sea levels, it, rather a lot. They don't they don't care. Um, oh, I think they care. Yeah, I think they care. Well, I think I think it's more of a I think it's more of a tug of war. Um, you have the oil industry on the one hand, which is damned and determined to get to the the resources under that ice. Um, if you Google think, the new the people, Cold War, you can Google this right now. Global wants to melt Antarctica so they can get more oil, and at the same time, they're going to destroy New York. Um, well, I mean, if you look at disaster capitalism, that's the way things always work. Do you think that the fracking industry cares about you know putting poison into aquifers? I think um, the scientists care about New York and Florida, and uh, well, where I live, Sacramento, okay. that would be underwater too. I would agree with you that, and that's why I say it's a tug of war. I mean, on the one hand, uh, it's pretty extreme what you're suggesting here. This is uh, I I don't think it's rather. I don't think it's extreme at all. In 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 fact, when you when you look at what's going on, I mean, we just take the airline industry for for example. On the one hand, I've got 35 documents talking about adding fuels um, fuel sulfur content to Mm -hmm. airline um, jet fuel to cool the planet biofuels for contrail control they're doing the access flights one and two the nd max flights now with germany's dlr nasa and um and the rest and they're talking about you know taking accidental geoengineering from aircraft and turning it into cooling clouds um ulrich schumann at the icao colloquium on um contrail mitigation he said we want less warming more cooling contrails predictable for operational control when i interviewed like a good idea yeah so but. then I, I okay to you it does um and when i spoke to dr rangasai Thori from the aviation climate change research initiative at the faa i interviewed him y- you remember um he said we want more contrail induced cirrus clouds by day and none by night um and to just put a you know a, a coating on the whole thing, you know. Um, then there was the idea of cocktail geoengineering put out by Ken Caldera and company. And what they said was if we could do cirrus cloud thinning in the Arctic and still create clouds by day and do them in certain targeted locations, then we could cool the planet by cocktail geoengineering. So what was accidental geoengineering is now becoming an active experiment with just the contrails and this is a fact i mean well you you say it's an an active experiment which kind of implies that they're actually doing something rather than just simply studying the effects of uh, of contrails no one i don't think is actually trying to uh, shift contrails more towards nighttime i mean the idea here is that uh, at, at night, oh, sorry, away from nighttime. At nighttime, clouds act as an insulating blanket and keep warm mm-hmm. thin. And in the daytime, they reflect the sun's rays and they, they essentially make things cooler. So okay. the idea is you would have more contrails at night, uh, no, sorry, in the day, and that would cool the planet. But you're you're saying that's an active experiment, but no one's actually doing anything with that well, other than studying the effects of uh, things to see what happens. Um. Well, I mean, let's just look at the way things are going and what the what the stated purposes of these experiments are. I mean, the, the article originally was 2013 biofuels for contrail control. They've done access one and two uh, aviation cruise control cruise effects of um, 
uh, alternative aviation fuel. I mean, the idea is that they are, you know, when I've got 20 papers that say, let's add fuel sulfur to the, you know, add sulfur to the jet fuel to cool the planet. And then in the access flights, they tested a biofuel, a 50-50 mix of biofuel, which is called a drop-in fuel. So it's biofuel and JP8. And then they Mm -hmm. tested JP8 doped with sulfur. Uh, and I asked Dr. Rangasai Halthori, I said, why were you guys testing the JP8 dope with sulfur? He would not give me a straight answer. And the answer is very simple, that they know that sulfur has a cooling effect and that if they could increase the fuel sulfur content of jet fuel, that it would cool the planet. That's their theory, um, which is no different than David Key's theory or Ken Caldera's theory about, you know, stratospheric <laughs> sulfur injections. Um, that if they could put enough sulfur up there, they would cool the planet. So is it an active experiment? No, um, it is actively being experimented on. That's the it's e- being studied. It, it's being studied at the ND Max Ecliff 2 right now. This is the third series of biofuel um, tests. Um, there are already many major airlines flying biofuels. Um, and the flip side of this is, there are other um, proponents out there saying that it's going to cause more climate change because now you're growing gasoline and monoculture cl- crops are lead yeah. to soil erosion. And so it's like the only solution they have um, to this contrail conundrum, it, it, you know, which was highlighted by Jasper Kirkby at CERN, you know, in his cloud project that basically their their only solution is biofuels right now. I, I went and I spoke at the EPA hearing on flight pollution. And, you know, of course, I told everybody in the public, this is about chemtrails because I, I said this to Dr. Rangasai Halthori. I said this, and I want to ask you what you think about this thought. If, um, if, if one were to, um, you know, if one were to point it, like say I point at a cloud and I say chemtrail, and then you point at the same cloud and you say contrail, that we're both right. Um, that at the end of the day, these are just words being used to describe what we see and perception is reality. Um, I wouldn't say they're just words though. People have a very different reaction if you say that's a chemtrail versus that's a contrail. Because people, people, the uh, the connotation of a chemtrail is some kind of uh, either toxic uh, spraying or some kind of deliberate spraying, whereas a contrail is just an ordinary contrail. So I, I think there is a very big difference in the the way you label things, and you know if you're gonna call something a chemtrail, I think you really need to have more than just saying, oh, that's just what I'm calling contrails now because they have this effect. Well, I mean, in, at the same time, I have a completely different definition of chemtrail than you. So, and, and you know, I was speaking yeah. with... You can't just use your own definition. I, I most certainly I can, and I'm, and I'm going to prove I'm right by this way. Chris Fallen was the director of HARP, okay? Right. I was and, just talking to him earlier today. Yeah, I, I talk to him on the phone regularly. Um, and he, he, I'm going to be doing an interview with him soon. Um I was debating with uh, Fox meteorologist Paul Delgado about this topic. And what I said to him was, look, chemtrails can mean many different things. Sounding rockets are chemtrails. And he said, oh, that's just BS. And of course, Chris Fallen tweeted, "Um, actually, Jim is right. You know, we release trimethyl aluminum, we release lithium, we release barium, we release, we release strontium. In the past, we've released cesium-137. These are, he this said, is semantic. It, it, in other words, I mean, t- actual chemtrail, think- legitimate chemtrail science. I mean, what yeah, do you think about that? Don't you think that it's, you you again, you're confusing people. You, you, why don't you just say what these things actually are, like sounding rockets? I did. Or rockets that go did. basically and I, up and I into say space. that in my videos. I say they're and sounding then you rockets. Say, yeah, you say, then you say that these are actually chemtrails. But that's just doing a very loose definition of a term, like saying a trail that comes out of the back of something that contains chemicals 
or is being chem- sprayed out of the back is a chemtrail. So what why is, don't you call crop What is a contrail? What is a contrail? It's a condensation trail. What is a chemtrail? It is a chemical trail. It's it, That's my point about all of this, is that people are so focused on semantics. You're is, uh, I, I, uh, I'm very much focused on semantics because I've read the anatomy of slave speak and I understand how you can control people through words. And that's what a lot of this debate is about, the control of individuals through the use of words. So you're just making your own definitions up of things. I'm not actually making in my definition of the, the, the basis of the word chemtrail is chemical trail. The basis of the right, word contrail exactly. is condensation it's, trail. So how many literal. chemtrails do you know of? Well, sounding rockets happens to be one. Biological weapons happens to be one. Uh, oil dispersion sprays happens to be one. Uh, Agent Orange is a chemtrail. I mean, how car exhaust? Car exhaust is a chemtrail. Correct. Breathing, breathing is a chemtrail because the carbon dioxide and other chemicals come out of your mouth when you breathe. At the same time, I'm it I'm, becomes I'm, meaningless. It becomes it, meaningless if you're just that, saying something that's coming out of something that contains chemicals is a chemtrail. It doesn't mean anything. Exactly. You're confusing people. You're I'm confusing not, everybody. With but these that's things. the thing. I start off with chemtrails from space. And then I say, what is this chemtrail from space I'm talking about? They are called Black Grant sounding rockets. They are used to study upper atmospheric winds. They are used as tracers to see the Van Allen belts and the magnetic field lines, which are invisible. These metals stick to them. That's what, the same thing they do when you get a CAT scan or an MRI. So where I'm not trying to confuse people. What I'm actually doing is saying, look, you've, un- you've heard the word chemtrail. I don't think you really understand what all of these different things mean. I'm going to explain it to you and give you the references. So uh, you tell me any other conspiracy guy, because I'm not a conspiracy guy. I focus on facts um, that will go and say, look, I'm ta- I am taught. I may have called it Ken Trails from Space, but I'm going to talk to you about the combined ra- radiation release experimental satellite and the Arecibo ionospheric heater that he- you know, heated those chemicals. I'm going to give you the experiments. I'm going to show you the payloads. I'm going to tell you why they did it, how they did it, when they did it, map it, put it in a timeline. Um, I'm I'm trying to educate people on the facts behind weather modification, geoengineering, and space weather modification. The problem, though, is that you start out calling things chemtrails, and then you say, look, here's evidence of chemtrails, and like NASA's doing these sounding rockets. And most people are not going to go beyond that. They're going to hear you say, like, here's chemtrails, here's evidence of chemtrails. And you see it all the time, I'm sure. You've seen people like post like pictures of the sounding rockets. There were those recent ones that were done where they did like five at once. Yeah, it Project was really displays. Yeah. yeah. And they say, look, these are chemtrails. And they don't go beyond that. So by calling them chemtrails, you're actually really distracting from what they really are. You should start out just saying these are sounding rockets. If you say that they are chemtrails, that's that's essentially giving validity to the whole ridiculous chemtrail theory that there's all this deliberate spraying going on constantly. And you, I mean, you, I, I would love to, to, to disagree, to agree with you, but I mean, you can go to climateviewer.com right now and on the front page, it says project Azure sounding rocket chemtrails from space. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm straight up saying the name of the project, they are sounding rockets. Then I say chemtrails from space. But even in my little subtitle, I say barium, strontium, and trimethyl aluminum chemical releases from NASA-funded auroral zone upwelling rocket experiment Azure. And then right. I give you links to the website from the grand initi- the the grand challenge, the initiative they have going on, where they're going to try to launch all these rockets over the next couple of years. Uh, what they're studying, the ground-based radars that are you know being shot into these. I'm trying to fill people with facts. So, yeah. So that's great. I, no, that's great. But I just, I, I really feel that, you know, using the word chemtrails, I mean, do you do it deliberately to kind of draw people in? Like, you know, they go, oh, chemtrails. Yes, and then you yes, tell I them. The, I, I, I the very truth. clear, I very clearly said for years, you know, originally all I talked about was, you know, jet exhaust. And what I would do is say, Hey man, you want to know about chemtrails? Everybody talks about aluminum and barium. Well, let's get to the bottom of this. Is there aluminum and barium in chemtrails? 
And, you know, I've got a, one of my most popular articles on climateviewer.com is aluminum, barium, and chemtrails explain just the facts. And, I mean, I, I point to the IPCC report, 3.2.3.2 metal particles, and they say metal particles comprising elements such as aluminum, titanium, chromium, um, iron, nickel, and barium are in there the jet exhaust. People- a lot of people take that you know you you say you found aluminum and barium in in contrails or jet exhaust and they say oh look proof of chemtrails and they say oh this is proof of a covert geoengineering program so you're you're giving them this information but i think by kind of leading with the idea that it's chemtrails is that all they're going to do is they're going to take these these the bits that they like like in your title like project azure sounding rockets chemtrails from space People are going to take that as being actually chemtrails from space. Most people don't read the articles. Most people. I, I'm fully aware that most post. people don't read the articles. I look at my statistics. I realize that people watch, you know, if I do an hour long video, they watch 15 minutes of it. If I do yeah. write an article, sure. you look at the time on page, it's two minutes, 30 seconds. Nobody could have read that article in that amount of time. So I understand the problem of attention deficit disorder. I understand that it's TLDR. You know, most people are like that. But I don't cater to that that audience. You have to understand that. The most emails I get from are other climate scientists. I mean, that's the that's the bulk of my you know audience. Or you know, of course, on YouTube, it's different. YouTube, you have every single you know different kind of person. It's you know a schoolyard basically. You ha- you never know who's going to show up or how they're going to interpret what you're saying. But I don't really cater to those people because. You know, obviously, you know, if I if I did, if I filled my stuff full of fear porn, I'd have 300, 500,000 subscribers. I'm not trying to make a living doing this. Mm-hmm. I'm doing this because I'm interested in the topic. I want to yeah. know the facts behind it. And I think that, you know, there are a small majority majority of people who are interested in the science behind this. So well, I, I, I appreciate that and i you know i think it's great that you're trying to you know educate people but you, you know you've got a quite a following in the chemtrail community like people people saw you you went to, to the epa they had an open hearing where people could speak about uh, i think it was like the carbon dioxide regulations and you were there and patrick roddy was there and patrick okay. roddy is kind of like a hardcore chemtrail guy who thinks that everything he sees in the sky is a uh, evidence of, of geoengineering I, and you agree. are not but then yeah, so, so here's the thing together. they see you together so let me here's the thing with that um what happened was uh, an individual who is a hacker friend of mine said hey look i found this text file on an epa ftp server so it's a file transfer protocol server that was announcing Hey, we're going to do a public, you know, we have public input on this. And if necessary, we will have a hearing. So I submitted in in writing that I would like to be a part of a hearing. Senior policy analyst from the EPA, Lucy Audet, called me and tried to talk me out of coming. This video is on my YouTube. You can listen to her beg me not to come. And um, I said, no, I think we should do this anyway. And we ended up, so because I was the only person who actually said so, they then had to post it on the EPA website. So then I see, you know, the itinerary of all the the airline industry um, represented pilots association is going to be there. Sierra Club, all these people are going to be there. I said, well, it'd be a shame for me to be the only person to go, you know, that is the dissenter. So why don't I take some people that have different opinions than me and invite them to come as well? So of course, Madison star moon, Amanda Bays, Mm -hmm. I invited her because to me, you know, even though, and I've told this to her on the phone that I think she's crazy. Um, and she, you know, we, she knows how I feel about her and she knows she, I know how she feels about me, but regardless, I told her, I said, even though I don't agree with you on everything, what you have done is you've been one of the most vocal you know, people I know, calling government institutions. I mean, that's what you do all day long. And the thing that they never give you is a straight answer. Um, so I'd like you to come. And uh, Max Bliss, he got word of what was going on. 
And he called me and he's like, how do I get in on this thing? And Max is from France. So um, I explained to him the process. I said, you know, you need to send your email here if you want to be a speaker. And I don't know that they'll let a foreigner in, but give it a shot. And interestingly enough, Patrick Roddy was sitting in the room with Max Bliss at the time. I don't know how that, I don't, I mean, that guy, I don't know how, where, how he gets to, to fly around the globe like he does, but regardless, he was sitting next to Max Bliss and he's like, Hey Jim, never met you before. Uh, what if I come to, and I'm like, okay. I mean, I didn't know anything about Patrick Roddy at the time, to be quite honest with you. Um, I didn't know who he was. And Michael Saracino was a follower of mine on Twitter he actually gave one of the most sobering um, discussions there where he talked about the rates of autism around airports, you know, and the link to breathing in metal aerosols and black carbon. Um, and he he cited more scientific papers than any than anybody else. And in fact, than everybody else combined, um, his I published his paper on um, climateviewer.com for everybody to read because I thought it was that good. Um so at the end of the day, it's the same idea that I said to Dr. Um, Rangasai Halthori. I, you may not know this, but um, Amanda had me on her radio show. We actually called Dr. Rangasai Halthori three separate times, and we had three separate discussions. Um, and what I said to him was, why when Amanda calls you, you know, when, he call, when she calls the FAA and she says, ah, I see all these chemtrails over my house, they're blocking out the sun. I don't like it. Why does the FAA come back and say, chemtrails are not a thing. Those are condensation trails, and they are perfectly normal. Instead of saying, we here at the FAA take chemtrails seriously. In fact, we understand that the climate implications of these cirrus clouds that are being created by planes is so grave that we are trying to use biofuels and innovate next generation transportation systems to avoid the climate effects of aviation and the pollution that's created by it. That would be a much more honest answer. Well, I think, just, you know, it, you, it, you, it, you just, just put the word like chemtrails it's, it's, in their mouth. Uh, like, you know, they wouldn't for a start use the word chemtrails because, you know, they, they would say chemtrails aren't a thing because really chemtrails aren't a thing. And they, the common understanding of the term, which is this, this large scale spraying program, yeah, you you have a different definition of chemtrails. So well, yeah, I don't the think they... the difference is he actually agreed with me. He says, you know, actually, I think we could do a better job on that. Yeah, but that he didn't was agree with you word. that chemtrails are a thing, except in your uh, semantic uh, version of it. The problem is if the if the EPA or uh, the FAA says that you know, chemtrails are if they use the word chemtrails, then all of a sudden everybody's going to say, oh, that's an admission that they've been spraying us for years, when obviously that's that's not true, uh, except as, again, in a semantic way, well, that there's pollution from planes that, well, that has effects. I mean, let, let's be realistic about this. Both you and I know that the contrails have persisted and created serious clouds since the early 50s, right? Since the 20s, actually. Yeah, I mean, as far back as it, we've been flying, you know, even mm. when propeller planes, yes, they've been creating clouds. Um, my favorite article was 1958. Uh, palms, uh, jets, uh, jet trails, dim sun, Palm Springs gripes, yeah. followed up by the next year. Um, Air Force tells city of Palm Springs, live with the trails or move the city. <laughs> so, I mean, and then in 1972, the state of Illinois and New Jersey sued the airline industry over making clouds. I mean, right, but very... these are contrails. Yeah, they are, but... as the FAA would say, just ordinary contrails and basically live with it like everybody else is doing. You know, most people, they see these cl- uh, they see contrails all the time and they couldn't care one way or the other because they grew up with them. They're used to the fact that we have contrails in the sky. Uh, but if people become convinced that they are you know, chemtrails, then it, it takes on a whole different meaning. So I really wouldn't you know, expect the FAA to start using the term chemtrails. Well, I don't expect them to use the word chemtrails, but you know the true sign of intelligence is to speak to a person on their level and be understood. And like I said to him, if I go outside and I point at the sky and I point at a cloud and I say chemtrail, and a scientist goes out of the sky and points at the exact same cloud and says contrail, both people are right. 
because at the end no, of the day, I, and I respectfully, you know, I understand that you will disagree with that and I'm okay with that. But the problem is that it's just a word being used to describe a cloud, whether the individual doesn't understand that this is not a chemical poison that is sprayed to eradicate the planet or it's an intentional geoengineering program that when they call it a chemtrail, that's slang and it can be an overarching term. It is used by many different people. It is, you know, infected mm -hmm. many parts of our society. So when they deal with somebody who may not be as smart as you and I, that they should be more receptive to their public input when they call the FAA and say, I'm concerned about this and say, look, you know, I understand that you believe these are chemtrails, even though we think they're, we, we know that they are contrails. I understand your concern with them blocking out the sun. And I mean, you've got yeah. a BBC article, telescopes will be useless by 2050 because of air traffic. Um, that's a real world concern. Solar energy. Yeah, yeah energy. There, there are real concerns regarding contrails, but I, you know, like I say, I don't think that calling them chemtrails is the answer. But you know, I think we could probably go back and forth on this. It's going to have an old argument that we've had over the years. We, we, we have like had briefly. this argument for a very long time. I would. <laughs> yeah. That. I want to talk to you, like, real briefly about. So we don't have much time left. But, uh, you don't. You mentioned fear porn earlier. And you have an article on your site about Nibiru. And I guess this is something that you, you, you obviously don't believe that the Nibiru is the idea that this, 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 this planet in the solar system, which is uh, doing something, you know, coming towards Earth or orbiting the sun. And people make all these prophecies about it and stuff. And you've, you've written about this, and I guess, essentially from a debunking perspective. It is, actually. Um, so th this is why... Yeah, you know, and, and I thank you in part for you know my position on chemtrails. To be quite honest with you, um, early on, I was I would say I was more inclined to believe a little bit of everything. You know, like I was less critical of what I was reading, and the common Elenin uh, phenomena that happened, you know, it was 2012 is. C-2010X, the comet that was supposed to end the planet. And, um, right. yeah, of course, um, I was going through personal issues at the time. I was being trolled by a group of YouTube channels that had hundreds of thousands of subscribers. They were making hundreds of videos about me. So I was in a really paranoid place to begin with. Um, and then this comes along and, you know, I believed it hook, line and sinker. You know, they, they say that every good conspiracy is a, a grain of truth. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they mix a little bit of science in there. And then, you know, there was this doctor, um, Mansur Omer Bashish. You're, are you familiar with him? Uh, crown yeah. prince of Hro Croatia, he claims to be. Um, mm -hmm. anyway, he has this website called seismo.info. And he wrote this uh, paper about the uh, increase in magnitude six plus earthquakes whenever there were galactic alignments between Elenin, Earth, and the Sun, or Venus, Elenin, Earth. Um, basically, what he was doing was remixing the music of the spheres or music of universalis, um, you know, from the olden days. The idea that there's resonant, you know, vibrations between celestial bodies that could react in earthquakes. He was mixing this and conflating it with Elenin. So he had written up all of these, you know, charts on how an earthquake happened when, you know, Mars, the comet Elenin, and Earth lined up. Right. So, you know, I was like, I, I believed it. And then when it didn't happen it hit me in the face and I'm going, how the hell could I be that stupid? Um, and that's when I read the article, the anatomy of slave speak. And, and the idea is simple. It's language that maintains a master slave relationship that people can use words to manipulate you. And when I, and, and there's a copy of the article on climateviewer.com. It's linked on the sidebar of every single page on the website. And the quote that I use to link to it is 
one of the saddest lessons of history is this. If we're, we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. And Carl Sagan said that. And I linked that to the article, The Anatomy of Slave Speak, and the idea behind slave speak is, is real simple. Language creates spooks that get into our head and hypnotize us. Um, that was Robert Anton Wilson. Ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? <laughs> um, Joseph Stalin. It is hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head. Sally Kempton. And the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, Stephen Biko. So this is where I come from this perspective of, you know, high level descriptor, low level descriptor, chemtrail, contrail, same, same. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a semantic, um, you know, ninjutsu. It's, it's verbal, you know, Kung Fu that people are so busy arguing over the words that they they miss the point you know it's like you know keep put look keep focusing on the finger and you will miss all that having heavenly beauty uh bruce lee um that people miss the whole point of the chemtrail debate that people are upset because they see clouds over their house and they're blocking out the sun and then some people go a step further and they they put all of these attributes on it and they say well they must be doing this. And it's, oh, it's definitely geoengineering. Um, even the guy who said it was geoengineering, he wasn't even talking about the clouds. He was talking about the ice haze. I say that in my videos all the time. You see blue overhead, you see white on the horizon. Those are aerosols. That's what the guy's talking about. The buildup of aerosols whitening the sky. That's what geoengineering would look like. Not clouds. But more and more, we're hearing about earth radiation management and cirrus cloud thinning and the focus of geoengineering using cirrus clouds, which are created by planes. So is it, you know, I, I have intentionally used the word chemtrail to draw people in, to get them to understand that this is a serious problem, that there are people actively experimenting on this, that there are plans to make clouds by day, none by night, stated by the ICAO, stated by the FAA. After our hearing at the EPA, um, during the Trump-Hillary election, um, you know, basically, if you don't mind, give me one second, I'm going to pull this up so I don't, you know, yeah. get this wrong. Um, but this is the timeline of what happened. Uh, it's right here. Um, so we had the hearing in 2015, uh, August 11th. July 25th, 2016, breaking EPA to limit greenhouse gases from airplanes. So they had decided they were going to limit greenhouse gases. July 25th, 2016, or uh, July 30, 31st, 2016, less than six days later, White House releases Federal Alternative Jet Fuel Research Development Strategy. September 3rd, 2016, China, U.S., and Europe pledge support for Global Aviation Emissions Pact. September 12th, 2016, Greens move to dismiss EPA lawsuit over airplane emissions. So China, Europe, um, and the ICAO in the U.S. agreed to use biofuels to fix the contrail problem. And then October 10, 2017, NGOs slam UN aviation agency plan for biofuels. So it's, it's kind of ironic. You know, we went there with the purpose of talking about clouds and how people are upset about metal particulates coming out of planes, their possible effects on human health. Um, there are many, you know, many psychological uh, papers on, you know, spending habits of people, mental health conditions of people, just on rainy or cloudy days versus sunny days. Hmm. So the, my, my point being that this is a much more complex topic than people are, are talking about. You know, people, when you simplify it down to, oh, it's a depopulation program or it's a geoengineering program, every single plane's in on it. That's just pure stupidity. It's a, it's a, you know, there's never one single cause 
for anything. Everything is more nuanced than that. So what I saw happen with the EPA hearing was that the whole world agreed, we're going to use biofuels to fix this problem with the clouds. And by the way, we're not going to regulate the airline industry at all. Same thing happened in 1972 when they were sued over making clouds. So once again, the airline industry skirted any kind of real regulation. All of the bodies themselves, the ICAO, wrote its own regulations and agreed, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to use biofuels for contrail control. And now and you keep saying that they all agreed to use biofuels for contrail control. I mean, where, where are you getting this from? I and mean, they haven't all agreed that this is what they're doing and that is why they are doing it. I mean, it's right there in the article. China, U.S. and Europe pledged support for global aviation emissions pact, which was part of the federal. Yeah, they're supporting a pact is- to reduce emissions. It's not that they're going to use uh uh, con- you know, contrail control you by biofuels. The the emission to there is carbon dioxide. But I, and I would and I would respectfully disagree that you know that whenever you when I talk to the the head of the Federal Aviation Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative and he says we want to make cloud more clouds. Yeah, and not that, that's intent, dude. That's not. Hey, this is an accident. Hey, this is just a natural, you know, occurrence that happens as a result of aircraft. You can't say the entire world has suddenly agreed to use biofuels. That's not what they're talking about. No, but the leaders of the organizations that are in control of aviation have agreed that contrail mitigation through the use of biofuels and or sulfur fuel doping is the way to go. That is their plan. That is what the current plan is. So, I, and I, have I, to I disagree with you there. I, <laughs> maybe you, we can, you should uh, watch we can look at this up offline. And, um, all right. Well, then yeah. I'll, I'll send you, when we get off yeah. this, I'll, I'll send you an interview I did with Dr. Daniel Rosenfeld from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And he fully agreed with the, what I was saying. And he sure. is one of the top cloud seeding scientists on the planet that basically, that what may be considered just mitigation um, is active geoengineering that the idea that we would create clouds by day none by night that that is a stated goal just by stating that goal it goes from being accidental to intent let's just uh uh look at that real quick like creating clouds by day and none by night you can't do that just by modifying the fuel of course, you'd also have to fly, modify flight patterns. and In fact, you, most of what you would have to do is modify the flight patterns. It's yeah, fact, and, almost entirely, the, almost the entirety of that scheme is modifying flight patterns so that you, you route the planes either around or through ice supersaturated regions. The modifications of the fuel really doesn't do that much. Well, that I, w- I would argue with that by stating that I have about 10 separate... Uh, patents from Rolls-Royce to Airbus um, where they state that they could use two bio you know, two fuels in one tank uh, in one aircraft one part biofuel one part you know old style JP8 or Jet A and that a mixture of the two using the engine's electronic control unit that they could regulate the production of clouds also um, that in a recently pay- released paper um, Zapardia et al. 2015, they said we would use um, ultra low sulfur jet fuel on takeoff and fuel doped with sulfur at altitude, which would rele- uh, reduce mortality around airports and that would cool the planet by injecting sulfur at altitude. So I think the reducing mortality is probably the prime driver there. Reducing well, it, pollution of, of around airports is a much bigger problem in most people's minds than uh, the actual difference you could make by uh, changing the fuel at altitude. But, but, uh, but what I would say is that if you look at this in totality, I mean, and that's what I try to do. I try to look at the macro of things. What's the overarching theme here? And the overarching theme seems to me that there is much more to do about this cloud problem than just simply dismissing it as it's natural condensation. Um, Nothing to see here, which is the natural response you're Mm going to get if you call the FAA or the Euro control or any of these organizations, ICAO, that's what they're going to tell you. Um, 
nothing to see here, completely natural. But at the same time, um, with the projected increase in flights, with the amount of fuel you burned each year, with the effects that you know, switching to algae based, chicken fat based, yeah, more complicated. Know, yeah, it, it's a very nuanced, yeah. you know, problem. And that's, yeah. I try to focus on all of it simultaneously. Yeah. No, um, well, that, that aspect I think I agree with. Well, we're, we've kind of gone over an hour here. Uh, what are you going to be doing in the future with this, uh, this type of thing? I, I mean, Honestly, you know, like I, I, I kind of feel like I've, I've more than set out to do what I mm-hmm. intended to do. I mean, I created weathermodificationhistory.com to document it all in a timeline format. Um, been cited by Harvard, MIT, you know, the United Nations Environmental Program, um, export.gov. You know, like this, this is just a hobby that, you know, I do um for fun because i'm interested in the topic and i want more people to know about weather modification space weather modification ionospheric heaters all of these technologies because i don't think the lay person the general public know that it's even a thing while you know we listen to the news and we hear that every single severe weather event is based on climate change um and they never mention the climate changers the people who are intentionally changing the weather, um, I think that that's absolutely freaking ridiculous. Um, and a, yeah. again, I would restate that all of the people talking about climate change know that their models are flawed. Um, and I'll leave you with this. Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Teller Wood and Hyde, you know who I'm talking about. Um, Edward Teller, Lowell Wood and Roderick Hyde, published a paper in 1994 about the Pinatubo effect from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And they said, you know, this is how we long-term stabilization of the climate through spraying crap in the sky. And then the next, uh, 1997, their second paper came out. That's when Ken Caldera comes into the mix. And Ken Caldera was working at Lawrence Livermore and he made a computer model and he plugged in all the numbers and he said, you know, this geoengineering idea, it would be great. It would actually, you know, increase, you know, plants would grow better and everything would be just hunky dory. And then they wrote their third paper and everything was fine. Well, then I come to find out that Bill Gates, Ken Caldera, John Latham, Stephen Salter are all on the same patent for steering hurricanes. And then I find out that Ken Caldera, Bill Gates, Nathan Mervhold, the patent troll, are all on a patent for cloud ionizers they can rent to farmers to put out in their field to make the clouds either go away, make them rain, all this stuff. So you've got these guys who are claiming they want to save the planet for good reasons because of global warming, but they're also out there making patents for weather modification and steering hurricanes and the um, Department of Homeland Security had the Hurricane Modification Workshop in 2008. Who shows up? John Latham, geoengineer. Um, so you think it's so, a big, uh, yeah, a big plot, a big, yeah, so, a big no, conspiracy, I, but you think there's ulterior motives. You know, uh, I think that it's a mon- monetary issue. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. when David Keith owns carbon engineering, and he knows that he's got money to be made. If CDR, you know, car, direct carbon capture ever gets government funding, he's going to be filthy rich. When Ken Caldera has all these patents, and of course, in, in private emails, Ken's told me multiple times, I would donate all my money if these patents were ever used. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not in this for the money. Um, I see ulterior motives to all of these individuals. Okay. And at the end of the day, it all, it all usually goes back to money. With Chris Fallen from Harp, um, I see a nerd who's interested in electric science and radio science. I mean, he's a cool cat. I like talking to him. I'm looking forward to interviewing him. Um, but at the same time, we're finding out more and more every day about the, you know, the connections between the electrical environment surrounding our you know, planet, the ionosphere, the mesosphere, and terrestrial weather. I mean, this is not yeah. known science. And every day we learn more about it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we should have another uh, another discussion about uh, that topic, harp and uh, and whatnot, because that's yeah, another yeah. big, well, uh, I think, area I'll, with lots I'll of misunderstanding. I'll just summarily state that 
while I believe everybody blames Hart for controlling the weather and steering the jet stream, that that is complete BS. Um, I've said so to um, Chris. I I know this to be true. Um, and but at the same time, I'm you know got two companies, uh, Climate Control Global Trading LLC out of Dubai, um, the United Arab Emirates. Mm-hmm. They claim to steer atmospheric rivers. Um, my doc, uh, um, Dr. David Miles from Miles Research, yeah. formerly of Acquiesce, I interviewed him. He says he steers atmospheric rivers. Um, WeatherGenerator.net. They're another company out of um, the United Arab Emirates using cloud ionizers to steer atmospheric rivers. So what uh-huh. I see is everybody blaming HARP. And then you've got these companies literally online with websites saying, we do that and you can pay us to do that. So yeah, that's but where I they probably can't. I don't think they well, seem to be modern day, uh, uh, rain dance type people with their, well, uh, well, conjuring up rain. James Roger Fleming would agree with you when he talks about the, the three cycles of the pathological weather modifiers, you know, hope hype and, you know, mm-hmm. all of that. That, you know, in the in the age of pluviculture, which was, you know, from 1900 or 1800s to 1946, there were rainmakers. They made promises. They never delivered. 1946 to present, we've had cloud seeding. They make promises. They can't prove anything that they're doing is actually having an effect. And now we've got the third phase, geoengineering. They're making promises. They don't know what the outcomes will be. And they're basically writing a check. They're asking it cash. Um, I just think they're making promises, uh, the geoengineering people, (laughs) because they haven't actually promised that they're actually going to do things. They said there's potential of the technology, but they're not saying they can do this and that it will work. Well, um, I would say that that if you look a little deeper into it and you look at things like John Podesta and Hillary Clinton's um, super PAC that were meeting right before cop um, cop 21, the Paris Accord, they were specifically saying, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're actually going to try to make, get funding for geoengineering. We think it's a great idea, but God sakes, don't mention geoengineering until cop 21 is done. Mm-hmm. And yeah, well, this, uh, and the day it was over with, academics call for geoengineering in wake of Paris Accords' deadly flaws. Yeah. Well, so, there's a lot of things that we could talk about, and uh, I wish we had a bit more time, but I do want to stop this uh, now. So thank you very much, Jim. Very interesting conversation. Well, I appreciate you uh, having me on, uh, Mick. It's been a long interesting ride uh discussing things with you and uh yeah i look forward to doing this again sometime uh you know I, you, you're you're no pleasantly known as the darth vader of chemtrails uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm pleasant, but <laughs> yeah well i mean you, you you serve a purpose and i mean honestly you know you you've educated me on certain things i i like to look at your website and then go um you know I see where he's telling the truth here. I don't agree with him on this fully because I know this, Mm -hmm. but I think that, you know, overall, you know, your heart's in the right place. Um, I agree with you that a lot of people believe way too many crazy ideas about chemtrails. In fact, it is to be quite honest with you for me personally, it is my least pleasurable thing to talk about because you know, every time I speak my mind and say exactly what I feel, you know, they come out of the woodworks to, to throw yes. poo at me. Um, <laughs> but that's just, that's just All the right. nature of the beast, right? All right. Kids are impressionable. That's why here at this station, we watch the programs and commercials your child watches carefully. He may see bad guys, but not in the role of heroes. 
and he'll learn that crime doesn't pay. Because your child's welfare is our concern, too. That's part of our code. Better than anything you can get without a prescription. Anything. It's the best.